Good morning, everyone. Um, this is essentially picking up where John and Darren left off. It wasn't planned, but we kind of made a little trilogy of talks. Um, obviously, we communicate subconsciously, telepathically, over distance. I didn't realise we did that, but it's quite handy. So, um, yeah, I want to talk to you today really about why we have to care about paleo art and the impact it can have and how it can really shape um, the public perception of different animals. Um, generally, when we talk about popularizing um, paleontology and you know, new paleontological concepts, we talk about how difficult it is and you know how we can go for decades and you can throw as much science and as much evidence and as much outreach as people as you want and yet people will maintain outdated, preferred, you know, stereotypical views of animals. It would be very difficult to shift them from that. We talk about how difficult it is, as Elsa was just doing, how difficult it is to introduce new extinct animals into the popular canon. So if you work on things like carnivorous fishes, if you work on Mesozoic mammals, you work on Cretaceous amphibians, you stand no chance of getting uh, a successful outreach campaign if someone finds out something new about Tyrannosaurus on the same day. That's just how it is. You know, we have dinosaurs have a real stranglehold on um, pop culture paleo, and that's not it's not a bad thing. Dinosaurs are really good, but I have detected at this meeting there is kind of an undercurrent of yeah, look, we all like dinosaurs fine, but we like other stuff too, and we want to get that out there. And I think this is a real issue. Um, you know, it applies to paleo art, it applies to the popular culture of paleontology generally. And then at the same time, our colleagues in publishing. Uh, our consultant colleagues working with media, um, with media companies, you know, we, we just don't get the kind of innovation that we want. We get the same stereotype views of animals again and again and again. And attempts to change those, even at sort of uh, you know, the ground roots outreach level, is very difficult. You can see that you know, it does feel like we're hitting our head up against a brick wall. The brick wall here is made up of completely similar images of Archaeopteryx in this case. So it's the same image repeated over and over again for about 80, 80 years. Um, you know, it's, it's, as I say, it is frustrating. And although we do, I think we do appreciate that we do change things over time, it just feels so slow. You know, we just feel that we are, we're, we're making an incremental process with updating the public and, and different paleontological ideas. However, on rare instances, rare instances, we do get very rapid change, and we can find these almost as watersheds in the portrayal of, uh, of, of, uh, of paleontological concepts in, in popular culture. So we might see things like the, uh, the appearance of a familiar animal, that might be radically changed in the space of a few years, there may be something that happens, and then suddenly all the subsequent um, pop culture depictions of that, of that animal are very different. We can sort of look at it beforehand and afterwards and we can define which side of that event, that image or you know, that uh, recreation, whatever it is, was produced on. Or we may simply see a change in popularity. We may see an animal sort of introduced into the pop culture canon and it's suddenly um, you know, far more prolific than, than it used to be. And generally speaking, when we're talking about these rapid changes in um, in pop culture, we're looking at the big franchises. We're looking at Walking with Dinosaurs, we're looking at Jurassic Park. It's unsurprising that these things have the impact that they do. They have tremendous audience outreach. They have huge amounts of money to throw at their imagery and their graphics. You know, they look photorealistic. Even if the science isn't quite there, they look good enough to convince people that the science is there. And we have this issue of perceived scientific integrity. Um, anyone who's done consultancy work on documentaries will know that sometimes they're not quite as tight on the science as they're claiming to be. And it might just be in some cases that you ask them, did they talk to the experts? And they say, yes, we did talk to experts. Did you pay any attention to the experts? That's another question. But we can definitely see that franchise, uh, franchise um, paleontological products do have a big impact on pop culture. And um, yeah, Darren actually picked up on some of these examples yesterday. We can look at things like the walking with dinosaurs like Pluridon. That has gone on to become its own essential you are mean. Uh, the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, I mean the Jurassic Park T-Rex is everywhere there. That's just what everyone thinks a transport looks like and it's very difficult to actually convince people otherwise. Uh, look, we can look at Jurassic Park's Velociraptors as well. Who knew what Velociraptor was before 1993 and now everyone knows what it is. So these things do have a high impact and they can change things quite rapidly. The question is, can we do that as well? Can we do this as scientists and as researchers and as artists and as educators? Can we have the same impact as things which have cost billions, sorry not billions, millions of dollars to put together? 
I think we can in the right circumstances. And what I want to talk to you about today is some work that I've been involved with and some of the other people in this room, in fact, have been involved with, um, and to say how we can actually introduce changes quite rapidly into popular culture, look at some of the conditions that may have led to that. And the example I want to use pertains to the animals on the screen here. This is uh, an Ashtarki pterosaur. And as I'm assuming everyone here is, is uh, familiar with the, with the animal Quetzalcoatlus. Heard of this giant pterosaur, 10 meter wingspan, one of the biggest flying animals to uh, have ever flown. Uh, this, that is an Ashtarki. They are these toothless, long necked, short winged pterosaurs, um, very spectacular animals. And um, in the last few years, we've seen a, a very rapid change in how they are depicted in pop culture. Darren sort of lays in the groundwork for this yesterday, so I won't dwell on this slide too long. Essentially, Ashtarkids have been known for almost a century in terms of their, their fossil, uh, our first fossil discoveries of their fossil, but we didn't really appreciate what they may have looked like until significant remains were found in the 1970s. But as Darren pointed out yesterday, it actually took some time for researchers and artists to get a handle on, on what these things actually look like. So the first pictures of our shark is basically, hey, we need a picture of a, a 10, 15 meter wingspan pterosaur. Can you please draw us one? What does it look like? It doesn't matter. Just please draw us a giant pterosaur. And we ended up with our first picture of, uh, of Quetzalcoatlus in about 1975. This, as Darren mentioned yesterday, went on to form its own sort of small head, sort of pin-headed, um, head-nubbing Ashtarkid meme that persisted for a good couple of decades after uh, the original pictures were made. However, we can see that these pictures here are also from the late 70s and 1980s. We also see the introduction of very different types of Ashtarkids in the body here. We have an Eli Kish reconstruction, which has got a much longer face, it's got a shorter wing, we see, again, another set of very different looking Ashtarkids. These are actually pretty good. You know, knowing what we know about Ashtarkids today, we can look at these reconstructions from the mid-1980s and say, you know what, these things are pretty much what we think these animals might have looked like. A few things that, you know, may maybe experts might quibble with, but they're not too bad. You know, these were actually pretty close to the mark. They were not very successful in terms of changing the appearance of Ashtarkids. These were sort of in a, a bubble of isolation when these were published in the, uh, the mid-80s. Essentially, these people had access to all the unpublished Quetzalcoatlus material, and no one else did. So these people knew what they were doing. No one else really had that, that advantage. And so, you know, the, 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 uh, I guess the, the grounding uh, and the understanding for why these animals looked as they did was not made publicly available. As I say, the impact was not significant. And so when we get to the 1990s, we see yet another appearance of Ashtarkids. And again, these are in most cases meant to be kept quartless. And you can see that the animals change appearance again. We now have this sort of snub nose version. The head's got longer, but we have this very um, robust, abbreviated snout. This version here has teeth, well done the BBC and dinosaurs. Um, we see, yet, yeah, and then you can't quite see the end there, so I cut it off. But we see another version of more slender than there. We look to the um, <coughs> we look to artwork directly supervised by scientists, so appearing in books and exhibitions and um, publications that scientists are actually writing themselves, and we see yet more diversity in how our dark is depicted, and not only in terms of their anatomy, but in terms of their behaviour as well. There is so little consistency in how these animals are, are, are depicted and what they are shown doing. And you've got animals here that are scavenging, you've got some of them flying over the water and plucking fish by swimming feeding mechanics, you've got a cartoon there showing how these things cannot possibly be on the ground because of the, uh, the stiffness of the neck, and then we have just showing them actually, yes, they are being on the, on the ground, and they're waving like crayfish and things. It's, it's really all over the shop. There is no unified sort of synthesis on what Ashtar kids were like, what they were doing at, the, at this point. And this is, you know, by this point, we're looking at artwork being produced in the early 2000s. You know, some of these pictures here are from sort of 2004 or thereabouts. So, as I say, no real consensus on, on what's going on. In the latter half of the uh, of, of, of the, uh, the 2000s, sort of about 2007, 2008, we saw a lot of interest, a lot of research interest in Ashtarka pterosaurs. And this is because pterosaur research in, in, its, uh, in itself is undergoing uh, a, a slow renaissance. There's a kind of this reinterpretation going on with um, in, in pterosaur science. And we're looking at these animals in very different ways. And Ashtarkas have sort of become, if you like, poster children for that revolution because essentially they are so big. So they, they allow us to take these arguments that we're applying to small pterosaurs to almost absurd levels, and it means that we can really start to detect the problems that we have in pterosaur science in, in general. So as a good example of that, um, around the um, 
in the, in the 2000s or 2002, 2008, we had publications coming out saying these things actually need to weigh an awful lot more than we previously thought they did. People have been saying in the past these things are in there about the uh, same weight as me, about 60 kilograms there about. Well, these things are the size of giraffes, there's no way that can happen. They have to be a lot bigger, a lot bulkier, maybe about a quarter of a ton. Doing that means we have a lot more muscle mass on them. They're much more powerful animals than we previously realized. Um, we then get to go on to estimate their flight capacity in, a, in much greater detail, much more muscle mass on there. These things are flying much more effectively. Um, there's been continued work into the pterosaur terrestrial locomotion, how quick they were on the ground, how efficient they were on the ground. Ajdarkis seem to be particularly efficient uh, uh, animals when they're, when they're walking on the ground. And we've managed to constrain their ecology. So all these different ideas about how Ajdarkis are feeding, we actually have a much nicer idea about how these animals were uh, obtaining their food. And it looks like they're more, um, they're what we call terrestrial stalkers. So they're walking around on the ground, basically picking things up. Uh, anything that can uh, fit, into their, fit into their beaks. We haven't got time to go through all the science there. What I want to say is that associated with these uh, publications were some pretty standard press releases, you know, a little bit of PDR, uh, a press release from the university, uh, some blog posts, uh, a few open access papers, and all this sort of thing. What I want to introduce to you now is post-2008 PDR art of aged orchids, and things are looking a lot more uniform. Um, so consider what we saw a few slides ago, look at these pictures here. Everything is with these nice erect limbs that we've, that we've predicted in, in uh, ecological models. They've got uh, consistent head shapes, consistent neck lengths, all this sort of thing. Ashnarkas are suddenly the stars of multiple documentaries and films, so things like um, the David Attenborough Flying Monsters documentary, Walking Dinosaurs 3D, the feature prominently in there, the BBC's Planet Dinosaur documentary. They appear in comic books, so we have Ashnarkas here, terrestrial stalks to death, my favourite thing in any comic book ever. Um, and these are identified, uh, identifiably Ashnarkas. These are not generic pterosaurs, these things are clearly meant to be um, Ashnarkas. And we see them appearing in toy form as well. Again, looking very, very similar to the um, predictions made in 2008. And this is in the last few years. So compare that to what we saw in the last few decades. It's really all over the place. In the last few years, we've seen consistent reconstructions, uh, which have more in appearance, consistent in pose and behavior. And they suddenly seem to be a lot more popular than they used to be. They're no longer just footnotes in dinosaur books for kids going, by the way, some pterosaurs got really big. Now they're actually there. In comics, they're fighting with people. In um, you know, they've got prominent scenes and documentaries and all this sort of thing. So I think we can say that yes, there has been a watershed in the portrayal uh, of Ashdarkid pterosaurs in pop culture. And I think this is quite interesting because we're always wondering how does this happen? How do we make animals popular? Well, maybe this is a case study that we can use to try and analyze some aspects of that. And so to go through some of the, my thoughts on, on how this may, may have happened. I do think it is a case of the conditions being right, if you know what I mean. So it helps that the public have an idea of these giant pterosaurs to begin with. They may not have known what an Ashdarkid was, but they might have known things like Quetzalcoatlus. They knew some pterosaurs got really big. So they were kind of primed for learning about giant pterosaurs, I expect. They were already featured enough in pop culture that we can detect a difference. Uh, before and after the sort of 2008-2007 period. If you've got an animal which is only appearing in pop culture every decade or so, you're not going to be able to detect these changes as rapidly. But Ashnarkids were there just about enough that we could detect the difference. The new interpretations that, um, that were associated with this science basically made Ashnarkids really cool and really awesome. So we went from these kind of clunky, you know, fragile wind, uh, pretty rubbish animals to be honest, and we turned them into monsters, you know, we turned them into things that could come and eat your grandmother if they were around, around today. And that's got to help, you know, that's got to help us sell these things to the public. Is that, you know, these are fuel for the imagination, these animals. You just have to look at the paleo art and it just, it sends your mind off to, you know, imagine what these things are like. They're towering over you. They're so big, they, you know, their heads are three meters long. Really cool animals. And we just made them more interesting. Obviously, that wasn't the focus of the, of the science. We weren't out to make them more interesting. That's just sort of the consequence of of the, of the research. And so I think these, that, if that's the how, I think we then need to look at what agents were actually used in changing the perception of our darkets. And you know, we can look at any scientific outreach as really being based on three things. We have the, uh, we have the actual research and the publications. We have the PR itself, you know, typically the kind of PR articles, popular articles. And we have the associated paleo art. 
to cut to the chase, if we look at post-2008 Ashgarhis and then compare it to some of the paleo art which was used to promote the science, we can identify lots of features, lots of little quirks about these pictures which are not necessarily, they're, they're not standard. You know, these things are, are not what you would put in all Ashgarhi reconstructions. These reflect quirks of the artist, so things like putting a mane of uh, buzz down the back, the shape of the head crest, um, the fact that we depicted it um, eating a baby sauropod. Well, it doesn't have to be a baby sauropod, it could be any small animal. But we consistently see, as Darren showed yesterday, there is now uh, a, an abundance of paleo art showing Ashdarkis specifically eating baby sauropods. There are also a whole bunch of mistakes in our old artworks, so things like overflex wrist, this hunchback, the position of the shoulders. These are things which, if we were to make these pictures now, we would correct those. However, other people have been incorporating those into their artwork. And this is all evidence that it's not the research papers. Oh, sorry, and just to say, there are some examples where things are a little bit more blatant, you know, where the, the, um, the results of the artwork, the results of the products are very clearly influenced by specific bits of artwork that, um, that myself and colleagues have produced. And so we can look at the three elements that go into um, the, the, the going to art and we can say, well, the thing that's had the lasting effect is the paleo art. It's not the science, it's not the it's not the um, PR articles, it's probably the paleo art which is lasting longest in public perception. And how we might interpret this, and how can we actually, what should we take from this? The public is sensitive to our out outreach efforts. I know it feels like we're banging our head up against the wall all the time, but they are listening to us, maybe somewhat selectively, maybe they are out listening for those things that they are more interested in, you know, those things which are more immediately accessible, but they are listening. And I think that's an important message, you know, we, we are, uh, we don't have to do crazy outlandish things to get attention sometimes, that they are out there, you know, if, if we're doing, um, doing things on the right animals, we can be successful in getting our message across. And the third thing I think is, is that the yeah, art again, comes up as an important agent of that. This is how people are remembering scientific outreach and scientific press release. So, uh, and we can actually detect that impact by looking at aspects of the art that's been, produ been produced and seeing them replicated in subsequent artworks. So these are all, I think, fairly, fairly positive points, but we do need to think about, does this have, not necessarily a you know, negative things for us to think about, but maybe there are some, maybe there's some um, responsibilities we need to think about this as well. Because if we can, if people are listening to our outreach, then we need to, we need to remember that, as well as inspiring change, we can also reinforce stereotypes. So we need to think about when we're doing, when we're putting our uh, outreach out there, putting new art out there, is it up to date enough, you know, is it, or is it just reinforcing old, outdated ideas? We need to think about, well, if we are able to have these changes, what happens if our work is falsified? It's great that we can change things, can we change it back? That's not, you know, science is not a linear process, and sometimes we do want to revise what we've said. And when we're dealing with potential high-impact taxes, so things like Ajdaki pterosaurs or big, sexy theropod dinosaurs, do we need to bear these points in mind and think, Maybe, do we need to sort of consider an element of responsibility? Is there like a right amount of PR to do, just in case things are a little bit, you know, I'm not necessarily wrong over time, but in case things become a little bit controversial here? Can we, do we want to try and um, manage our impact? You know, it's not just about having high impact, we want to have a manageable impact on, on, uh, on popular culture. And the last thing I really wanted to say is, is just a little bit more on that. So, um, a recent example of one of the biggest PR campaigns ever associated with the publication of uh, a paleontological paper was the 2014 reinterpretation of Spinosaurus. Is everyone in here familiar with, with this? So this is taking bones from across all of North Africa, putting them into one species of animal, the same looks like this. Each of these different colours represents different bones from different bone bears from different countries and all this sort of thing. And people are now saying that's all one animal. The amount of PR artwork that was done for this was tremendous. We had 2D paintings, life-size 3D models, we had loads of popular articles about how they were put together, we had digital and physical uh, skeletons put together, animated sequences for films. It will not surprise you to learn that the PR campaign for this was instigated months before the paper was even put into peer review. Yeah, I'll, 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 not, uh, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to think about. Just to give you an idea of the quality of this, this is brilliant stuff. I mean, look at this art here, this is fantastic. This is, you know, this is the, the, the pinnacle of paleontological PR outreach. And this is just a fraction of the 2D art. 
We have the life-size 3D model. We have the only um, paleontological outreach I ever know that's had a dry ice machine. We have the front cover of National Geographic. We have the documentary. We have the animations of the, um, of, of the revised uh, Spinosaurus in the documentary. And we have the touring exhibition, Traveling the World, showing this new version of Spinosaurus. This is fantastic stuff. Like, as PR, this cannot be faulted. This is, you know, if you want to get your message out there, this is high-impact stuff, and it's absolutely brilliant from the like, PR popularizing paleontology point of view. However, the science behind that 2014 reconstruction has been widely criticized by a number of people. You know, there are now peer-reviewed papers which have come out saying we don't think you know, some of the assumptions there may be incorrect. We have... Um, Conference, um, conference talk where people are questioning functional morphology. So we basically, we have this version of Spinosaurus out there now, which is, you can't miss it. You know, if you're living on a cave on Mars with your fingers in your ears, you may have missed this, but anyone else is going to have seen this. Anyone interested in paleo is going to have seen this. We can't go and add addendums to our PR campaigns. We can't say, here's our new animal. Oh, but by the way, you need to go and see this list of references for alternative ideas on this animal's uh, you know, life appearance and, 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 uh, and its reconstruction. And so we just have to ask ourselves, we are always pursuing the biggest impact in paleontology. And I think most of the time that's fine because we're limited by budget. We're actually limited in scope of what we can do. When we have got the backing of people like National Geographic, these big, um, these big media outlets, do we need to be a little bit more managed in our approach just in case our hypothesis is not maybe as robust as we, as we think it is. And that's really where, where I want to leave you. So I think, as I said, between myself, Darren, and John, um, unintentionally, but the message from, from the three of us, I think, is that paleo art is so important in our outreach. It's what people remember. It's how people get interested in this stuff. We need to make sure that it's produced correctly, you know, that it's, it follows an appropriate methodology in production. And we need to make sure that when we're putting it out there as educators and as people interested in outreach, that we do that in you know, a sort of a best practice. And um, I'll just say that if you are interested in sort of the, the, the whole world of PBR art, how it's disseminated and you know, the, the sort of the work and practice of it, um, the article here, which I've Darren flagged up like yesterday, called A State of the Paleo Art is well worth a read if you want to read about how paleo art works in modern paleontological outreach. Uh, and thanks very much.